following is a hockey podcast out of Vancouver and Surrey, British Columbia. It'll only consist of a lot of puck talk and even more BS, or in actual words, banter and satire. Enjoy and as always, go Canucks, go. Uh, what are we doing? Yes, what are we doing the moment? The, Can- the Canucks, your Canucks lose to the Arizona Coyotes. We're talking about the Stanley Cup. Why? Because I'm a Hindu, and that's Trevor Becks. Your Locked On Canucks, your daily podcast on the Vancouver Canucks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Three games to go until the real fun begins. Welcome to another episode of Locked On Canucks. My name is Trevor Beggs, co-host of Locked On Canucks, and also a Canucks writer since 2013, currently with Daily Hive Vancouver. Before we dive into today's episode, we got to thank you for tuning into Locked On Canucks, because guess what? It is your Canucks every damn day. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you go subscribe or follow us for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, got to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by Indeed. Indeed, when you're growing your own business, you have to make every dollar count. That's why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applications that match your must-have job requirements. Visit Indeed.com slash locked on to start hiring now. Terms and conditions apply. And who knows, Kyle might be looking for another co-host of the show if my Wi-Fi doesn't hold up on today's episode, but I'm still here, baby. And guess what? Your Canucks, they may have lost to the Arizona Coyotes, but you know they're still one of the best teams in the NHL. But you know, those Canucks, they're, they're just not perfect right now. They're not perfect. They haven't inspired a ton of confidence of late. And you know, there's two guys who, if they get going, would inspire a ton of confidence in this market. So we're going to talk about those two guys today. They share the same first name. You know who we're talking about. Elias Lindholm and Elias Pedersen. What can they do and how close are they to breaking out for your Vancouver Canucks? That's what we want to kick off today's show talking about. We will also touch on, you know, shout out to uh, our our old friend, the late, great Jason Botchford, um, the Sea of Grandlands. It has re-emerged for your Vancouver Canucks. Who are the guys in the Sea of Grandlands and who is the most likely among the Sea of Grandlands to emerge and make an impact for your Canucks come playoff time? All that and more on today's episode, but before we get to all that, let me introduce my co-host. He would never get lost in the Sea of Greylands because he's the best podcaster I know, Kyle Ballon. How's it going, Hey, buddy? man. Also the best Hindu, you know, man. I've been learning more about more about my religion, man, for real, my culture. And again, the marshmallow curry thing, that was a new phenomenon. I didn't, did not know that. And just I thought you hopeful, made that up yesterday. Just this hopeful energy that I have in my stomach. Like, we just lost to the Arizona Coyotes. We had, like, 12 shots on net in the first 44 minutes of that game. And what am I doing here? I'm still thinking of the possibility of this team being the best in the league and the best version of itself. And, yeah, the only way I see that happening is if both Elias and Elias step up to the plate and live up to their potential. And I think we're seeing strides towards that. And I think we saw a big boat of confidence if you're, you know, looking at the inside of your heart and looking at the Canucks side of things and just seeing the display that Lindholm put on yesterday. I thought his effort was really good. I thought he was used a lot. I thought he had some key face-offs. I thought he had some scoring chances, blah, blah, blah. I do see a shining light at the end of the tunnel again. I don't know why I'm like this. I got called out for it on the Discord. Join the Discord in the link in the bio, link in the bio. But again, some optimism, man. Optimism after that loss against the Arizona Coyotes, okay? For real. And maybe I'll break it down in the second segment because something emotional happened for me during that game. Uh, but I'll talk more about that again in like 10 minutes. So let's get right into it. Elias and Elias, right? They hold the keys to the Canucks dynasty, uh, dynasty, their destiny this season. And uh, how confident are you that, again, both these guys can get to that level that we expect them to be? And a second part to the question, how do you think they get there? You no, know, Kyle, I think it's uh, our opinions on Elias and Elias here are contrary to the way most of Canucks Nation is feeling right now. I look at these two players and Elias Pettersson and Elias Lindholm. Tell me if I'm wrong. I think they are they the, the two most criticized and chastised Canucks right now. No one oh. seems happy with the Lindholm trade right now. Everyone is viewing it as a ripoff, even though they might have liked the deal at the time. It just hasn't really worked out so far. And with Elias Pettersson, like I, I, he's just the whipping boy of the market right now for whatever reason. Like people are hating on Elias Pettersson more than they are on Tyler Myers. You know what I mean? It's it's crazy how uh, far we've come, and you know the dollars play into it. And you know the guy, the guy does have sky high expectations attached to him. But I do truly believe that both players are on the verge of a breakout. 
Um, Elias Pettersson again scored his first goal in a while last night. I believe it was 10 oh, games. Really? Was it 10 yeah. games? Is that right? Scored his first goal in 10 games because the uh, Arizona Coyotes only had only had one shot did, on goal. Did you see? Well, okay, I, was, I had to cut you off because I, you're you're kind of not uh, here for a bit. But um, did you see how uh how much he was pressing yesterday? Like you mentioned, how he only had one shot on net, right? I feel as if in the first 25 minutes of that game, he had three glorious scoring chances or three chances to get you know a puck on net. But there he was, fanning or missing the puck. It's it's quite evident that this guy's confidence is not there. And I hope that that goal he scored at the end of the game last night gets that gear going because um, this is not an injury thing. This is definitely a mojo thing. Uh, Begsy, you know what? You've lived a long life, okay? 31 years old. I can see some gray hair, blah, blah, blah. Like, what did you do, right, in this thing called your life to – Get your mojo back because there's ebbs and flows to this thing, right? Hmm. Um, I would say, you know, three things I would usually do. Go on a walk, get some fresh air, right? That's that's mm-hmm. number one. And um, can I say this on a family program? Blow, no, blow no, your no, load you and no, no, well, for yeah. 20. Okay, there you go. Okay, <laughs> let's talk about it. Patterson, man, continue, continue. <laughs> oh, Matt, you're right. He is squeezing the stick right now. And... You know, I, I do think his game is trending in the right direction. I think you've seen some good plays in his own end. Um, I thought even in the Vegas game, I talked to some coworkers after the game who were criticizing him. I thought Pedersen played a really good, a really good game against the Vegas Golden Knights. Mm-hmm. Throwing the body around, he had some good defensive plays that were, I think, kind of unheralded. Like, you know, it was a turnover here, but overall, I thought he played a pretty good game. And people might go like, low bar, it's a low bar. Yeah, okay, but this guy is trying to find his confidence again, right? And, you know, hopefully he finds it fast. But I, I do believe he's going in the right direction here. Look, Pedersen has too much skill to, you know, not be scoring and not be producing. Um, and, and, yeah, I, I do truly believe he's close to a breakup. Maybe it's just more of a feeling uh, than going into the fancy stats and being nerdy mm-hmm. like I usually am. But, you know, I, I do think this guy's going to turn around and play off time. Kyle, I know you feel the same way, right? You said on yesterday's I- episode. Um, that Pedersen, you you think that Pedersen is going to win the con Smythe instead of instead of Quinn Hughes? <laughs> yeah, man. I, and I I think that again, this has been such a storybook like season. So much randomness, so much uh, you know, so much good, so much great, so much magic. And then there's like this lull right now. And you know, after beating Vegas in such a quote unquote historic way, and then losing to the Coyotes via a comeback and a penalty shot that didn't finish the right way and a blah, blah, blah. It, it, like, I can't believe I'm about to say this, but it feels like it's all going to come together on Saturday when the Canucks play their biggest game since 2011 or 2015, if you want to count the Willie D era as a, I don't know, real history. But you know what I'm saying? Like, it's it's all coming down to Pedersen against may, maybe McDavid plays. I feel like he will play if the division is on the line. Straight up, straight up, I, I do. Something in my heart tells me that. Something that in my heart tells me that Demko will be there too. But it's all lining up for Pedersen not to just produce, but be dynamic. Be an assassin. And again, yesterday, it was very, very clear for 58 minutes that this guy is not confident. Doesn't have his mojo. And it's it's astonishing for me, and again, delusional of me to say that, okay, now on Saturday when everyone is going to be watching, the whole hockey world is going to be watching, one of the biggest games of the season, that this guy turns into that, that guy, uh, Mr. 11.6, right? And steps up to the plate. I mean, it's not a playoff game, but it is a playoff game. And again, Saturday, it's it's a pay-per-view event. Uh, mark my words, okay? You can hold me to it. You can hold me to it, okay? Patterson is making yep. his comeback this Saturday. Well, let's go, man. That's the energy we need in this city. Look, he's he's got the tools to do it. We've seen this guy step up time and time again. Um, you know, third star of the month in January, hundred points last season. Like the guy, the guy knows how to play hockey. Okay. Um, and, and Kyle, I, I like to agree with you. Um, you know, a, a couple more things I'm thinking about on this segment here, uh, Elias let again, I thought probably his most noticeable game, uh, as a, mm-hmm. as a member of the Canucks last night, like, like you said, just really engaged, uh, a lot of good battles. Um, now, do you think, because uh, I do believe Elias Lindholm is on the verge of potentially breaking out as well, but he needs to play with better line mates. He's not yeah. breaking out if he's playing with McKay and Lafferty. And mm-hmm. I, we do want to do a, a, another ideal lineup episode before the beginning of the playoffs here. But do you think that, you know, we talk about these two players on the verge of breaking out. Do you think it, there's a better chance of them breaking out if they play together or apart? I, I think it's impossible for Lindholm to break out if his line mates are Mikheyev and Lafferty. 
you know, we're going to talk about the Sea of Grandlands in a couple of minutes, but he can't just, you can't get the ceiling with Lindholm if he's in the bottom six with this roster. It's just the truth. And I know Tockett wants to play this three line, three big centers down the middle, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we're not that too, we're not far away or that far removed from Teddy Bluger being one of those big three centers. You know, I know it sounds crazy. I know it sounds crazy, but via the chemistry he had with Joshua and Garland, he was playing at an optimal level. You know what I'm saying? The best version of the Vancouver Canucks is when the third line was playing really well. It's, it's, you know, I brought this up yesterday too. This is like, again, uh, reaching for a grand slam, being super delusional. But I think part of the reason why I was like a little upset with Pod Colson against Vegas, because it ultimately led him to be a healthy scratch and it led to not a lot of options for Rick Tockett to put Lindholm around a little bit more skill. You know what you're getting with Lafferty, and I, I I don't even know exactly if we know what we're getting with Mikheyev, but his hustle's there. He looks faster. He's winning board battles, but man, that guy with the puck. Let's for example, let's say he wins a board battle in the offensive zone, steals the puck away. How confident are you that he can bank it over to the point? Because the puck seems to die. Three out of ten. Stick. Three out of ten. It's, no, so <laughs> that's something that they got to figure out, and it's uh. Again, we're talking about the Stanley Cup and being a contender. And now we need uh, both Elias and Elias to live up to their potential. Bro, it's like, listen to this Canucks fans. It's just the truth. I don't see Lindholm living up to his potential if he's a bottom six player on this team. The Canucks yeah, didn't go at the back. deadline. They, they, they didn't go to the, they didn't, they didn't trade for anyone at the deadline. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They didn't bolster their winger group. Yeah, I'll, I'll push back on that a little bit because I do think the most successful version of the Canucks includes three lines. So, you know, whether it's, a, again, you reunite the best through line in hockey or you have someone with top six skill on Lindholm's line, um, I, I do think that you could have three lines that you could roll. And, you know, again, I do believe that Lindholm could, could potentially break out on a third line, but he's got to play with guys other than Mikheyev and uh, and Lafferty there, okay? No more Sia Gradlins uh, for Elias Lindholm. Uh, but again, Pedersen and Lindholm, if they can truly break through like we believe they can, Kyle, I do think, again, we talk about this team being you know, among the contenders. And I think they're getting lost in the mix right now. They're being doubted. We talked about and rightfully that last so. week. Rightfully, rightfully so, though. Yeah, rightfully, and right, so, and though. rightfully so, to a certain extent. Yeah. Uh, no, you know, no, for, no, for not US, to a certain no, 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 no. Okay, for, throw... for, for the USA Today guy who said that the National Predators were better than the Vancouver Canucks, I think that was a bit asinine. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I see your point to an extent. Well, the Canucks have been 500, playing at like a 90-point pace since the All-Star break. They're so inconsistent with the way they play the game of hockey, you know, like outside of a couple strong periods, offensively speaking, like this team is, yeah, they're, they're shooting the puck a lot and they're missing the net and like, Oh, their shot total should be higher. If they hit the net, like it's not that bad. It's just, there's just this, uh, unsexiness. Okay. Like consistently showing in the Vancouver Canucks again, they played the Arizona Coyotes. Oh, you don't think they got word yesterday that, uh, Vegas was losing to Edmonton by like five goals and that Edmonton was going to, you know, get get a couple points. Like, you didn't get – and what did Vancouver do? Again, in the first 45 minutes of that game against Arizona, a team that got evicted. You're you're, you're, what, what did Bondi say? You're facing the Salt Lake City soakers. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like – and what did Vancouver do for the first 45 minutes? It took them It took them a, a Quinn Hughes turnover to, to wake up. And that's confusing to me. And that's why, again, they're being doubted because this team is so, so, so inconsistent. And also – so, so in need of Thatcher Demko. Okay, we'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. Uh, Trevor Beggs, who are we shouting out on this episode of Locked on Canucks? All right, on the other side, we're going from uh, Elias Square to the Sea of Grandlands, all right? But before we get to that, let's shout out our friends over at Factor Meals. All right, Canucks fans, I'm telling you, you know, if, if you want the Canucks to win the Stanley Cup, you gotta, you'll got you get that oh. good karma in the atmosphere, and that includes treating your body right. Kyle, I know that you're not going to be snacking on McDonald's and Wendy's when the Canucks are going on their cup run because, you know, you want the Canucks to work hard and win a cup for you, you're going to treat your body right. Am I right, buddy? Am I right? Yeah, man, health is wealth. And, uh, yeah, karma, yeah, I'm, I'm down, you know. I'm down to taking all the good karma, man, for real. For real, man. And all you know right, what? Well, the playoffs are coming up. I, I got to put some good juice in my body and my temple because it's emotional. You know what I'm saying? And I'm an adult now. I can't not be optimal because the, my hockey team lost the night before. You know what I'm saying? 
Yeah, there, there's no more eating ice cream on the couch and crying, man. You know what you got to do is you got to have factor meals, okay? Because you can have fresh, never frozen meals that are chef crafted, dietitian approved, and ready to eat in just two minutes. You can choose from a weekly menu of 35 options, including popular options like Calorie Smart, Keto, Protein Plus, or Vegan and Veggie, okay? Looking for gourmet meals? Try meals that feature premium ingredients like filet mignon, shrimp, truffle butter, broccolini, and asparagus. No fuss, no mess meals. Factor meals eliminate the hassle of prepping, cooking, and cleaning up. Simply heat and savor the good stuff, okay? Factor is your solution for fast premium meals without the need for cooking. Kyle Bowen, a busy guy. He's got 28 podcasts to produce and record. A guy like Kyle Bowen. And you're listening, you need Factor Meals, okay? And get this, okay? Head over to factormeals.com slash locked on NHL 50 and use code locked on NHL 50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box. That is a screaming deal, baby. Use code locked on NHL 50 at factormeals.com slash locked on NHL 50 to get 50% off your first box plus, again, 20% off your next box while your subscription is active. Okay, okay, we back doing this, talking about your Vancouver Canucks, the team that just lost to the Utah Salt Salt Lake City Millennials. I, what? Are the, like, honestly, like it's so embarrassing losing to the Arizona Coyotes. I'm not gonna front, man. It's so embarrassing. I I, I shouldn't say this because it's it, like hate is such a strong word. But since I'm such a NHL fan and such a petty NHL fan and one of those like. Yo, watch my sport. My sport is way cooler than yours. Dude, the, the whole circus around the Arizona Coyotes for like two decades is just so annoying. And I don't want to say it's all like, congratulations. We did it, NHL fans. They're no longer no, going to play games in Arizona. But it just, again, it just, it's so annoying losing to this team. So annoying. Yeah. A team, it's, you, you, you no-showed for 45 minutes. I, actually, you know what? Scratch that. They played well in the first period. But you, you no-showed for a second period and a bit against a team that just got evicted. Just... Yeah, come on, guys. And I will say this is maybe grass with shots. I actually thought they started the second period well. They had a few chances to drive at the post. Like, there was a lot of zone time early on in the in the second period, and then just kind of hit the snooze button. And, and what did we say yesterday? Don't hit the snooze button, okay? Don't go to sleep for half the game like you like they did against the Ducks. And what do they do? They go to sleep for oh. half the game. And against a team of the this, Coyotes, who can score more goals than the Ducks. Yeah, and this is the truth, Trevor. Okay, like. I wouldn't worry so much or be traumatized or be a little scared or be so demanding if the process was better. Again, we're, we just saw another game where the Canucks offensively just looked so boring. So boring. And with that much talent, it shouldn't be the case. But at the same time, when Pedersen is this unconfident, this is what happens, right? It's a trickle-down effect. Because if Pedersen is not going and he hasn't really been going for like now we're now we're like talking about 27, 28, 29, 30 games of him not being optimal, what happens? You're searching for goals, aka you're asking other guys to do way more. And right now, guys like Pew Suter, Sam Lafferty, Teddy Bluger, etc., Mikhaev, Pod Colson, PDG. Dude, these guys aren't gonna get you a goal when you need it, okay? So much of the offense, so much of the uh, workload offensively via the scoreboard is on the shoulders of Pedersen, and that's not a – I don't think that's a a wrong thing to say. Hockey is a team sport. No, bro, 11.6, buddy. It's just the truth. The Canucks are not going anywhere in the playoffs or anywhere offensively on the scoreboard if Pedersen doesn't pick up his game. And again, going back to the Sea of Grandlands, <laughs> those guys aren't going to get it. At the same time, though, we shouldn't I, – I wouldn't you agree that the floor – these players are way better pros. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's a big reason why the Canucks, you know, I would say like 40% of the time are allowing like less than 25 shots a game is because everyone's bought in. They know what to do defensively. Yeah. Like, we shouldn't be searching for these guys to score goals. But man, oh man, when Pedersen's not going, this team offensively looks a little desperate. Yeah, and I think uh, I'm going to go to coaching for a second here because I, I do think a small part of it is the way this team's coached, right? You know, one of the interesting statistics about this team is that you know, we've talked about it. They don't shoot the puck enough. They're one of the lowest teams in the NHL in terms of shots per game, even though they've picked it up a bit uh, as, you know, they've been a 500 team, ironically enough. Um, but the interesting thing about them not shoot, like being one of the lower shooting teams in the NHL is that they have some of the highest offensive zone uh, 
uh, time in the NHL. Like the, the Canucks have the puck in the offensive zone up there with the league leaders in the NHL. So they hold the puck in the offensive zone for a long time, but they're kind of conservative in the sense that they don't take a ton of chances or they try to be a bit pickier with their chances, right? Um, and I don't know if part of that's kind of defense speed or what it is, but I do think it's kind of like the Rick talking mentality. So I guess my point is that, you know, with these players, like you said, Kyle, they're bought in defensively, right? This team does not give up a lot of shots. But when they're in the offensive zone, they're kind of conservative as well. And I think this kind of mm-hmm. is starting to hinder this team offensively a little bit, whereas earlier in the season, they were getting some of that good luck. They're getting into the slot a bit more. It was catching some teams off guard, and that's just not happening anymore. But at the end of the day, you make the point, yeah. you know, at least Patterson's got to score. But guess what? These secondary guys, someone's got to do it. Look at the goal scorers in the past couple of games, right? Last night you have um, yeah, Pedersen, Miller, and Garland. The game before that you have Garland, Besser, and Hughes. It's the stars that are scoring right now. It is not the depth guys that are scoring. And I'm going to throw it back to you, right? We'll talk about it, right? You know, Teddy Bluger, Ilya Mikheyev, uh, Pew Suter, Sam Lafferty, Vasily Podkolzin. Of those guys, who are you most confident in stepping up and actually starting to score some goals? Because those guys, you know, combined have, what, five goals in their last 100-something games? Like, it's, it's, it's really bleak right now in terms of secondary scoring. Damn. I wish I could answer that, but it's like, honestly, no one. Dude, I don't, okay. I got to bring it back to Pedersen, but those guys aren't scoring until Pedersen gets going. Until the top of the lineup, five on five, is just generating a bit more and being more clinical and taking the pressure off those guys to, you know, need a goal, to want a goal. Like, the Canucks are falling behind in games. Like, it, it, you're asking a bit too much from those guys, IMO. But uh, you know, to answer your question, I... I'd love to say Mikheyev, but I can't. I, I got to say this. It's it's probably Pia Suter. It's probably Pia yeah. Suter. That's kind of yeah, my guess. I, I agree. I think for, for a long stretch of the season, I, there was an argument until Garland really started to break out offensively that Pia Suter might have been the best Canucks forward aside from the big dogs. Um, and that might be a bit bold because Joshua and Garland have been really good, but Pia Suter defensively, it's just like nothing was happening when he was on the ice. He was scoring at a top mm-hmm. six rate. And I know it's kind of fallen off here over the second half, but for a large chunk of the season, Pew, Pew Suter has given you the floor, much like we talked about with the Elias Lindholm. Pew Suter has given you the floor, uh, but now that offensive floor has kind of bottomed out. Uh, I still, you know, if we're going to talk about lines, I still kind of like him on a line with Miller and Besser uh, as an option moving forward. So he's probably the guy like you, Kyle, I'm the most confident in. Um, you know, Mikheyev, it's like you said, the, the puck just seems to die on a stick right now. There's zero confidence there. Mm-hmm. The silly pot Coles, and like I know he's got it in him. We've seen it happen, right? You know what do you have? 13 goals as a rookie. Um, he's got more to give offensively. So Pot Coles is the guy I want to say will break out and not be a part of the Sea of Gremlins. Uh, but I'm not totally confident in saying that because the guy doesn't even have one goal this season, you know? Yeah. And how many shots does he have this year? Like, there's been games where he, like, you know, he's had chances, but I just feel like he's not. He's not showing that offensive flair, you know? It's, man, for the fourth time, the whole Patterson thing, man. It's the trickle-down effect, man. I mean, yeah, it was the beginning of the season and the shooting percentage was super inflated, but I'll make the other connection that, like, look at those guys and their numbers when Patterson was going. When this team didn't desperately need their third or fourth line to, like, make a comeback for them or do this and do that. Like, instinctively speaking, it's when those types of guys are behind in games, them overthinking it just a bit allows them to not generate chances. But if a guy like Pedersen was going, we talk about the trickle down effect with Demko. It's the same thing with Pedersen, man. Like it relaxes everyone. And right now the Canucks offense is going to continue to be stale unless it's not even just about Pedersen picking up points. It's about Petter, like Pedersen attacking, like setting the tone. If he's going and he's adding that culture, that flair into the lineup, game in and game out, it's going to trickle down and other players are going to play a little bit more free and more fun. Man, oh man, so much on Pedersen and so much on Saturday, man. So much on the line this Saturday, man. Straight up. Straight up. Uh, the bottom six talk, the the uh, the need for goals, the all this, the McKay of, uh, man, oh man, it really all comes down to Saturday because here's the thing. You can already give two points to the Oilers. They're going to win. They're going to beat Arizona. They're firing. They, they're not a cold team. They've been going at it for like 40 games. The Canucks have it. Saturday, man, the return to Pedersen. I'm calling it. Any other bottom six talk you, you got on your mind? Because 
You're kind of stressing yeah. me out. I'm not going to lie. Uh, well, I'm going to stress it a bit more. I just, I, I quickly pulled up Pod Coles. And I mean, you know, since his rookie season, when, you know, he was really decent, especially offensively in the second half, over the past two seasons, he's, he's played 50 NHL games. He has two goals and nine points in 50 NHL Ooh. games. Okay. Those are like pretty atrocious fourth line numbers and uh, a big reason why he hasn't been a full time in the NHL. But again, I believe Pod Coles has got it in him to, you know, be better than that. Right. I do think Pod Coles is, you know, a, a third line NHL player. Um, when he hits his peak, uh, which isn't what Canuck yeah. fans want to hear, but he's not at that level right now. So I believe in Pod Coles. Does he play on Saturday? I also believe in Pedersen. What's that? Does he play on Saturday? He, like based I, I would, on what I you, what you saw from the... I, yeah. You know why I say that? I, I think it's because, again, we played the Arizona Coyotes, and a guy like PDG and Sam Lafferty didn't do anything. Unless I'm blind. Yeah. Unless I wouldn't have seen it. Like they just didn't bring it yesterday. So it opens the door for Pod Colson to not only get a chance, but get a chance with Lindholm. We talked about it at the top of the show. Like, like there's a zero percent chance that he gets anything done with Lafferty and Mikhaev, but maybe that bumps up to fifteen percent if uh, uh, Lindholm is playing with Pod Colson. And I don't know if that's just me being high on this West Coast bias, but uh, man, oh man. The bottom six of the Vancouver Canucks. It's like, how, why is this a problem when earlier in the season we had the best third line in hockey? And since Joshua's been back, we've been up and down when it comes to the outcomes of games. And what haven't we seen? We haven't seen more than 10 shifts from Bluger, Garland, and Joshua. Weird. Yeah, weird. It's, it's an ace in the back pocket. Uh, I will say quick, it's actually, sorry, f four goals and nine points for Paul Coles, not two goals and nine points. But regardless, pretty atrocious numbers. Um, but again, I, again, I'm believing in Pedersen to break out. I see the physicality. He's just squeezing the stick. He needs, hopefully, that goal against Arizona was the damn bursting. But I've liked this game more recently. I liked Lindholm last night. Better days ahead. And yeah, we'll talk more about the biggest game, the biggest regular season game in a long, long time on tomorrow's episode. But let's wrap up the show with a couple comments and, and a couple more tidbits from last night's action that I do want to discuss. Before we do that, let's shout out our friends over at Indeed. All right. When you're drafting your fantasy team, do you ever wish you could handpick the best stars for your business team? If you're building your talent roster, you need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Don't spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can do it all with Indeed. Hate waiting? Who doesn't? Indeed's U.S. data shows that over 80% of Indeed's employers find quality candidates whose resumes on Indeed match their job description the moment they sponsor a job. You know, something I love about Indeed is that they make it so easy, okay? Shout out to Staples. Indeed, they did it first, okay? That was easy, baby. Candidates you invite to apply through Instant Match are three times more likely to apply to your job than candidates who only see it in search according to that U.S. data. And indeed, they do the hard hiring work for you. Sponsor a job and will match you with quality candidates whose resumes on Indeed fit your job description right when you post. With Indeed, you can start hiring fast. Indeed knows when you're growing your own business, you have to make every dollar count. That's why with Indeed, you only pay for quality applications that match your must-have job requirements. So make sure you visit Indeed.com slash locked on to start hiring now. Just go to Indeed.com slash locked on. Indeed.com slash locked on. Terms and conditions apply. Cost for application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need indeed. People, 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 we doing this. We talking about your Vancouver Canucks. We still thinking about the Stanley Cup. We still stressed out, though. We still all over the place. We don't know what we're going to get from Lindholm. We're talking about McKayev a lot. We're still struggling with Pedersen and hit. Like, dude, we're all over the place. And uh, the playoffs start next week. Like, what, in 10 days, nine days? I don't know. These I'm going to say, I'm gonna say I, 11 I, days. Uh, I'm going to say 11 days. So I don't know if you saw, but the, St the Stanley Cup playoff schedule came out. There'll be two games on, on 420. There'll be yeah. two games on the 21st, and there'll be four games on the 22nd. Now, the Canucks, um, their regular season ends on Thursday, April 18th, where some teams, mm -hmm. the regular season ends on Monday. Uh, so okay. I, I, I'd be pretty shocked if the Canucks weren't a part of, uh, you know, half the teams that, you know, kick off their playoffs on Monday, April 22nd. So look for that day for the Canucks to play okay. game one. That makes sense. That makes sense. Give them a little bit of a break, right? It is what it is. Okay, let's get to the comments. 
uh, before uh, Trevor, I don't know, talks more about Ely McCabe and Michael Granlin and just no, like, no, no, uh, no, no, no. Marcus Granlin, come on, man. Marcus Show Granlin, Michael man. Granlin, yeah, same ish, man. Okay, I saw one comment that really pissed me off. Okay, I think it came from Angela, and he usually pisses me off with the comments because he's so he's like emotional, like me, and it's like, dude, sometimes you say things that are so wrong, and he said something about the Canucks are soft, and that's one thing that the Canucks aren't. Okay, for real, this season the Canucks have laid the body numerous times. No, straight up, the Canucks, even yesterday, there were a couple big hits, huge hits. The, the, the Canucks, the Vancouver Canucks, this version of your Vancouver Canucks, they are far from so, soft. Like, have you seen a, a rise in physicality this season? And I know it has a lot to do with who's on the team and the size of their demon. But again, I just feel as if this team lays the body. Yeah, it's interesting because they have been one of the more physical teams in the NHL. So I I don't necessarily agree with that comment either. Um, that being said, I, I I do I do wonder how physical this team would become playoff time. And you know, physicality is not the most important thing, right? Like, you know, the Canucks were one of the league leaders in hits in 2017-18, which was you know part of that uh, dreadful Benning era. So mm -hmm. you no, know, it's not all about the physicality, but uh, you know that's. In yeah, terms but, of my concerns about this team, physicality's not up there. But but uh, again, like that year, 2017-2018 or 2016-2017, it was like Michael Del Zotto year, right? He led the league in hits or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so again, the Canucks are chasing. They don't have the puck a lot. Like those yeah. micro hits are happening, happening. But this time around, I don't know the numbers about the quantity of hits regarding your Vancouver Canucks, but I'm just talking about the, the size of the hits. Like there's been multiple yeah. gigantic hits. And it's good for the game. It's good for the fan base. And it's another reason why I'm actually really excited for the playoffs and am optimistic, even though the Canucks are so mediocre right now. It's because, like, I, I see, like, I see this team having the recipe to be a pretty intimidating team. And once a couple things get going, like the yeah. power play and Patterson, like, yo, know, something can happen. And the whole Demko thing, okay? So I think we also got this comment from Callum Sandu. I, I, I forgot to start the comment, but he said – uh Something amongst the lines of he thought Silovs played good yesterday. I know Silovs made a pretty big save when it was 3-2 or 3-1 and kind of sparked the comeback. But uh, uh, that second goal was so bad. So horrible. And yeah. And just that and stat first again. One, like, first one wasn't great either. <laughs> four goals on 17 shots. Like, keep in mind, like another reason why the Canucks have been struggling, especially in like recent history, I'm talking about losses to the Kings and the Coyotes, is because of goaltending. Yeah, you know, I, I said on yesterday's show, I thought the decision to start Silovs over uh, DeSmith was a mistake. I, I would have given DeSmith, you know, one more game before the playoffs started to kind of get his confidence, get his mojo. And not to say DeSmith would have been better, but I think he would have been probably hungry to have a bounce back game um, mm -hmm. and deserved to have the net yesterday. Whereas, you know, Silovs was good against Vegas, but he had a, he had a weak goal too. It's not like he was a world beater. Um, so I disagree with the decision. You know, hindsight is everything. But, uh, you know, I like to pop my tires when I'm, you know, somewhat right about things. Somewhat right because we don't know what Smith would have done. <laughs> hey, man, speaking of being right, uh, if you tell me to shut the beep up after this comment, go ahead. Because I, I don't like to be uh, one of those guys, okay? For real. I want to be accountable. I'm old now, 30 and a half years old. But uh, look at this comment, okay? Infamous, one of my favorites, okay? He said, fun game. I did pretty good considering the refing. And uh, playing sell-offs. Uh, let, let's talk about the officiating. And let, let's be honest, straight off the jump, refereeing sucks right now. They're so inconsistent, okay? Keyword, inconsistent. Because the Canucks tied the game yesterday based on a 50-50 call, a call that we would have been mad at, okay? Hoaglander drawing an interference call, embellishing. It is what it is. But all in all, it's, it's going to happen, you know? And, and whether it be the Canucks or another team, and I know we don't care that much if it's another team, but the refereeing, this year because those referees have not been held accountable all season long, they're going to cost the team a series. And it may be your Canucks, right? Because it seems like every single game, there's like one confusing call, two confusing calls going against them. Maybe it's happening to every single team in the league. I don't know. I don't watch all the other games, but officiating is going to get in the way of a playoff series, AKA the NHL officials. There's like a 4% chance that by the end of it, one of them is winning the cons mind. They suck. <laughs> they suck, bro. It's honestly, bro. If I'm an older gentleman who's watched the game for a long time and I'm spending game money to watch games and I'm seeing it night after night that these officials just suck ass, like they're just horrible. It, it kind of ruins the game, man. It really does. It does. Yeah, that's, uh, that's that's the emotional nature of Cal Bell. But no, I think most of the Canucks are the same way. And you know, even that penalty shot yesterday, 
I'm of, I'm of the mind like you know keep your stick on the ice and you know you won't get called right you, sh- you won't be a victim of having to be a, a, a you know a victim of a bad call but even the penalty shot yesterday it's like I felt like Schmaltz barely touched Hronik and Hronik went down you know what I mean but anyways yeah. you know I think the bigger story was Hronik's penalty shot uh, oh, man, man. man I hope I hope, I hope our performance isn't locked on Canucks your Canucks every day. Can I say one more thing? I'll say one more thing and we'll get to like, you know what? We got to do like a special comment corner episode sometime before the playoffs where we're just reading the comments and, and you know, we'll, we'll do post game show centered around that. Blah, blah, blah. We'll get to the comments, but I want to say one more thing. Okay. It's, it's just go Canucks go. Okay. It really is. It's go Canucks go. We're going to win on Saturday. Boom, bam. F the Oilers. And it, it, it takes me back to this. Okay. Yesterday I'm watching the game outside. You know, I'm putting my phone on my car, and I'm enjoying the game. We're down 3-1. We make the comeback. I'm feeling good. I'm like, dude, I'm outside in Vancouver right now watching the Canuck game. It matters. I'm blessed. I'm so blessed in life. And we were one shot away from winning that game. And what happens if we beat the Arizona Coyotes? What if Fred Lepronik scores on that penalty shot? What are we talking about today? You know what I'm saying? It was that close. And I know it's just the Arizona Coyotes, and I'm, I was complaining for, like, so long. How come this team has 12 shots through 40 minutes, you know, 44 minutes, blah, blah, blah. At the same time, though, when they went down 3-1, they could have just slept. They could have just rested until Saturday. And what did they do? They did their best to get a point, and that point was huge. Like, that wasn't yeah. a small point. That was huge. Yeah, 100%. And, again, it certainly doesn't guarantee the division. Like, Ducks pretty much need to win out to guarantee the division, but uh, Saturday's game against the Edmonton Oilers will be the big deciding factor. Again, the biggest regular season game in a long, long time. And, you know, when you tune into Locked On Canucks tomorrow – we're going to be talking about Oilers and Canucks, one of the biggest mm-hmm. games in a long, long time. So, Kyle, I think let's get out of here, okay? Shout yep. out to the everydayers, the occasional listeners, first-time listeners, new subscribers, and those of you who joined us on the live YouTube show. We love each and every one of you, your families, and your dogs, too. Go Canucks, go. F the Oilers. We got to get out of here. For now, I'm Trevor Banks. That guy's Kyle Bowen, and you've been listening to Locked on Canucks. Look at Angela's comment, man. We're not going to win, bro. You better not be watching the game on Saturday, okay? That's that's actually the truth. Don't watch the game. Straight up, man. I don't want you watching that game.